Hi, so welcome back to episode two. Uh, we previously were the Artificially Intelligent Podcast. Um, we are we in the midst it. of changing names, so we are currently under Asparagus AI, but we're probably going to change that. So if you have an idea that you think would be a better podcast name, leave it in a comment, and uh, maybe that'll be episode three's podcast name. Um, Send it our way, please. Yeah, so today we want to talk about uh, text-to-speech um, AI, and so... Something that Matt mentioned in the last episode was that he, uh, his company, Morning Brew, um, they took uh, Katie, uh, Money with Katie's voice yep. and um, trained a, a model to reproduce it and then summarized, um, what was it, a, a podcast episode with her? Exactly. Yep. And then made a synopsis article um, and then read it out in her voice. So we wanted to replicate that, uh, which Matt, you did. So yeah, exactly. We'll, uh, we'll splice in like a, a, a segment of that so you guys can compare our voices right now to the AI generated version of those voices. The podcast is called the Artificially Intelligent Podcast. And in this episode, hosts Ricky and Matt introduce themselves and their backgrounds as entrepreneurs and engineers. In part three, the conversation continues about AGI and the possibility of it becoming the dominant AI in the future. The discussion also covers the limitations of AGI in certain domains and its potential in others. What, what was your initial impression, Matt? Well, you said that to me, like, it, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, I, I feel like there's definitely, I can definitely recognize myself and you in it. Like, it feels like it's like 50%. So there's two, two different clips. One is of me, one is of you. Um, so in my clip, I feel like it's like 50% me and it's 50% a different voice. Like there's clearly identifiable traits of my voice that you can yeah. hear. And then there's, Clearly traits that are not me, that's something else. And then well, when yours is, is the same way. And it, it, it almost is. sounds like the same, like that the other 50%, right? It's like they have some like some sort of generic template that then they overlay you onto and you, you end up getting like the voices mixed. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how they do it. It's also a little uh, weird and unnerving hearing kind of your own voice, but yeah. not really your own voice. Um, I will say that for the presentation that my coworker gave at work, I was blown away. It sounded exactly like her. There was no artifacts. And I think in, in our speech, there's, it's very like unnatural. It's very monotone and the talk, it, it's just, it's not natural. Yeah. And there are some sliders and, and settings that you can adjust to try to make it a little bit more variable. So like the tones are changing and uh, they're, they're changing like the speed at which they speak. But I, I honestly wasn't super happy with it. And I think the main culprit of that was probably that our audio samples were not that great. Whereas Money with Katie, she's got, you know, uh, spectacular audio equipment and is able to get right. very high fidelity. Um, so I wasn't super, super impressed this time around. But ultimately, like th the whole workflow when we have this podcast that we created, I got a full on audio transcription done from uh, this company, Otter AI. And from that, I actually fed the prompts into ChatGPT asking for a synopsis of that audio transcription. And it was a lot of tokens. Uh, so I think I had to do it in like a bunch of different messages. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how much that affected its output and its synopsis, but um, it gave me that synopsis. And then I fed that into this um, in, into 11 labs is, is what the, the company is called that we use for the uh, voice synthesizing, I believe it's called. And yeah, we, we fed some of that, uh, the, the podcast that we had, some of the samples, and that's what it gave us. Like, again, it's very unnerving hearing your voice, but it worked. It worked. It know? definitely sounds a bit like the Uncanny Valley right now. Like, yeah. you know, it, it would be cool if it was good enough to interleave with your own content. So like sometimes I'm recording something directly and then post it, and sometimes it is just reproducing it. And if you couldn't tell those two apart, that would be pretty amazing. But yeah. right now it's definitely like like the the clip we have is definitely not that. So like you would you would clearly be able to tell like oh this is weird and like uncanny. <laughs> I really wanted to like potentially put some sort of like clip in the beginning of the podcast and like see if people could notice. But it's like it's very obvious at this stage that it is some sort of AI tool being used. I think in the future we'll probably see that start to uh, you know that I guess veil disappear a little bit where it's like. I don't know uh, what I'm listening to or what I'm watching, if it was AI generated or not. How far along, um, you know, will that be? I don't know. But 
I, I think like these tools are improving day by day, week by week. And it's, it's really interesting to see like how far they're coming and uh, how far they still have to go. Yeah, I think, um, I think the current version it's not quite good, at least the, the so our clip. I do want to I do want to try again with um, better audio quality. So, yeah, uh, I typically when I record through OBS on my laptop, I put it through a, a series of filters. So mm. it it takes off a lot of extra noise, um, and then yeah, there's nothing. The audio quality is is significantly better when I pass it through all of those. So I'm curious if I give you like a clip, you know, know. of uh, you know, just a ten minute clip of like pretty high quality audio recording um if it would be able to do better and if that would be like yeah because right now like the monotone like it it is good like it doesn't it doesn't have the like stereotypical robot quality um it sounds it sounds good it just doesn't sound i mean it sounds basically like as good as many humans which are monotone speakers yeah. it, like it, it is your voice right like you can detect hey these are traces of my voice in it right like and i think you yeah. know if i it's almost like uh if i had a, if i created a new channel put just videos that were created by that right and you never heard my voice so then it wouldn't seem uncanny right. it would just seem monotone i think you yeah. could get away with like maybe you have to dial up or dial down those pauses a little bit but if you dial on the pauses a little bit, I think you could make like a faceless YouTube channel with that voice and nobody there would know that it was there. an AI. Yeah, there are definitely channels out there that are doing that today. There was a few things that I tried playing around with the audio. Um, in post, I was using Final Cut to kind of edit it and, and take a look at it. Um, I tried speeding up the audio, even by just like a percent. And even that, for some reason, it's, it didn't sound right. I don't think that's uh, it. I think it's got to be the pauses. Like the, right. the speed of the words is correct. It's, it's the just space the between the words sound. that's incorrect. Yeah. 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 And I, uh, there was two things with that, uh, that I was thinking about. One, I tried cutting out, like we, we were working off of one audio file. So yeah, I, tried cutting I was wondering out, how much that was an issue. I tried cutting out my audio and parts of it as much as I can. There might have been like me saying something on top of what you were saying at the same time, or like me laughing in there. And I wonder how much like it picks that up and I also was wondering about that integrates that with your voice. I also think it would be like interesting slash funny to hear uh, like ASMR. If somebody like just feeds it ASMR samples, what the output <laughs> would end up sounding like. I think that would be really that interesting. That would be we should, hilarious. We should, we should do time. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the pause seems to be the most common issue. Like I remember so several months ago, um, like right before Christmas, I was playing around with some text-to-speech models and most of them were the same thing. Like the ones that sounded the, the most human-like still had these like weird pauses where it was just a little bit too long here, or there. And it's just like the flow is not quite there. It doesn't sound robotic. You know, it yeah, doesn't but have it's that like- get more natural eventually, right? Like it's, it's going yeah. to happen. Um, but did you see the clip? Uh, it was going around on Twitter where this guy, he did a rap and then somebody is uh, trained a model on Kanye West's voice. Yeah, I did. And then he did the the rap in Kanye West's voice. Uh, like, I think a lot of people are uh, like fawning over this video, but it's on, it, it's impressive, but it's still like, to me, noticeably not Kanye West. So you know, I, I think it still has that issue of like all of these um, all these samples where it's like, it's so close, but like you said, it's uncanny. And there's something you could recognize if you actually know that person's voice that, hey, this is this is not them. Yeah, I think the first applications will be things that are just separated entirely, right? Like you create a YouTube channel that you don't ever speak on directly. Yeah. It's entirely AI generated. Or you um, you know, create uh, an audiobook recording and it's just the AI. There's not, you know, the human version of that voice is just never played. That definitely takes away the uncanny element, and then you just have to focus on like tweaking to make sure that that timing is right. You don't have these weird pauses. Um, but yeah, I think there's interesting applications like that. I, I, yeah, I have not heard any version. Like, I'm very curious about this Katie version because, like, I have not heard any of these like text to speech or, or uh, speech synthesizer uh, models that really make it like completely fluid, like, like mm -hmm. just like the human. Like, they always have. Either like the weird like robotic tang, or they have these pauses. 
you, you know what it might have been? So it was he was giving like a presentation, right? So he showed a clip of it. It's not like he showed the entirety of the clip. Right. And so I think it was 10 to 15 seconds. Mm. That I think is like the sweet spot where like you're hearing it for a short enough period of time that you don't get a ton of those like same pauses. It's the exact same amount of pause every time. And you can start to pick up a pattern where it's like, I don't think this is a real person talking. Right. So that, that might be it where it's like, maybe if I listened to the longer audio clip, that would have been a problem. It also, um, with 11 labs, they specifically say, um, they have like kind of help options where the, the sliders will kind of tell you what they do. Uh, and they said, if your, your, your audio clip is longer than like a minute, I think, or, or something like that, uh, they really suggest you like dial certain settings back because it's going to really sound monotonous and, and very robotic. So interesting. maybe, maybe that's part of what I was hearing and why I got so excited about it. But maybe it was just a really good uh, transcription. I don't know. Yeah, the um, the intonation is like such an interesting problem. Like, you know, for for years, like people have been working on the intonation problem and how do you actually put emphasis on the right words, make the pauses the right length, and it's like a surprisingly difficult issue. Like, it's it's annoying that it <laughs> is so hard to solve that problem. Yeah. Do you think like? <sighs> I would think you'd be able to pick up patterns in human speech and be able to recreate it. But is there just something with like the way I'm like raising and lowering my tones and, and the way I'm even just like saying and, and right. Like that isn't something that AI would necessarily like mess up on because it's like so perfect in how it speaks. And so I wonder, you know, if that's part of like the human experience, right. Where you're not, perfect you're not just like flowing on like one cadence but you're up and down and you're thinking and you're you're pausing at different intervals like maybe that is like something that's very hard to reproduce i think it is i think it's hard to reproduce for yeah like basically that sort of reason right like you are um generating the content on the fly so there is a, a natural sort of like you know you're pausing you're thinking you're talking you're responding to the other person you also are sometimes purposefully modulating your voice like oh i want to create this punchline and then i'm going to make it sound a certain way or you know i am going to um be louder for a certain purpose or i'm going to be quieter to just like mm -hmm. i'm going to whisper something quick and then i'm going to go back now, loud you again, really, right now, now you really have to listen like yeah exactly so that i think is something that is not you know, like that that information is not captured just in the text um which is all we give it and so, yeah, that, that then is really hard because, you know, you need like a, a next level, like you need to, I, I think that I can't remember what the name of the model was, but I remember like a couple of years ago, there was some paper that came out describing a model and there's, uh, their idea was like, Hey, we're going to try to, you know, ascribe emotion to, um, the text and mm -hmm. then use that to create the intonation. And that was like a pretty substantial step forward, um, but it wasn't perfect because the model that read the emotion into it wasn't perfect. Yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's an issue, right? Like it's just the text itself is insufficient information for the actual message that we're trying to convey. And so you have to add extra information in. Um, you can try to imply, you know, you can try to read emotion into it, or maybe you, maybe you need to annotate the text, right? Maybe that's the solution. Like, I yeah. I was just going to say, like, maybe in the future, there's some sort of like markup language for emphasis and tone and, um, you know, these sorts of patterns of speech that maybe get generated from an audio transcription. Like, I give it a piece of audio and it can read that, synthesize it and use this sort of uh, like audio markup language to really like emphasize it. So it's just not like text on a page, it's it's emphasis. And then you could- I think like, there is, I think there is. I can't remember what it's called, but I'm almost certain yeah. I've seen something like that before. Although I don't know, you know, if you're going the way of generating the speech, how useful that is. Are you gonna actually annotate all of your text with the right emotion at that rate? You might as well just record it <laughs> <Yeah>. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work to do that, right. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't, I don't see that being something like you would do yourself. I, I think that is something that like a model would, would listen to and, and be able to, but I guess at that point the audio is already generated. So like, why are you? Like, I mean, what, maybe what it's just it? like a compositional model, right? Like maybe you have a, a staged model. So at stage one is you give it, you know, text and then it annotates that text. And it, mm. it basically like the paper that I'm describing, you know, you try to ascribe emotion, but you make that more sophisticated. 
Um, maybe you listen to a bunch of, you know, maybe you listen to five hours of my voice talking in different ways. And then you say, okay, he tends to annotate this kind mm. of thing in certain ways. Like yeah. when he use this phrasing, it tends to mean he's angry. If you use this, this phrasing, it tends to mean he's like really engaged. Um, and then sort of customize the way that you, you know, mark up the intonation. Cause I feel like that's really what you would need to like fully capture someone's voice but at the same time. A lot of people are just bad at sounding monotone. I'm I'm bad at sounding monotone. Frequently, I sound monotone, so like I have to actively try to not sound monotone. And I think uh, you know, hopefully, the AI would be better than me. Like you know, let's make the AI that sounds like my voice, but is like me at my best. You know, like yeah. me plus all of the greatest inflection and just makes me sound constantly engaged and never monotone. And then will just replace I, me on the podcast with the AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just like sit here and we'll, we'll maybe we'll just uh, text. get something. We'll just be yeah, texting we'll back and forth text. and the text will exactly. be translated. <laughs> I, I wouldn't doubt it if like the next iteration of 11 Labs is, is just something along the lines of um, adding a motion to the, uh, to like that voice synthesizer. So like I could say I want this read angrily or I want it read, you know, whimsically, uh, just something so it's not that monotone. Uh, unless it, it strictly just wants to be something where it's taking in the input of the audio samples and just trying to recreate something uh, that kind of matches that. Because, yeah, I, I do think uh, there's opportunity to to really like change exactly like how that's being output. It, it just it being monotone like that, I, I, it, it's got to change somehow. Right. Yeah. I mean, it honestly like it, it kind of kills a lot of the applications because, you know, as as good as it is it still sucks. Like it's still, it, nobody <laughs> yeah. wants to listen to a monotone voice. Like, you know, I've seen people talk about like, oh, I, you know, like I've seen people on Twitter say, hey, I, uh, I use this to create training videos for my, um, you know, for my company. I'm like, eh, it's great, but like, great. that's a really monotone voice. Like, do you really want to listen to that? Like, I mean, I kind of feel sorry for the people listening to that voice for three hours of training videos. Oh my God. And I mean, you, if you, you want to get to record sleep. it. So like, yeah. You you made it extra long and thorough. <laughs> I, I think that's a that's a good business idea. Is just you know putting people to sleep through AI voice generated content. That's <laughs> just that, that could be it. You know, like a bedtime story. Exactly, you know? like like rock a bye baby. On the <laughs> <laughs> just something super monotone. But I think it's really funny. It's like you're like as great as it is, it sucks. And like that is so true. Like it's amazing technology, and and it's so over. You know, my pay grade and my head for exactly how it works and and everything under the hood it, it fascinates me but at the same time it really is just just not there yet and and very uncanny and and recognizable and i think like that's happening across the internet right with a lot of this uh proliferation of even like on reddit or uh, yeah. people like generating content through ai it's very noticeable um and people pick up on that and and tend to like really want to disengage with that content because of that reason so yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that kind of evolves and shifts over time and, and what sort of like things people will do to to try to skirt around that because everybody's going to try it, right? They're, they're going to want to do the least amount of, of work for like the highest, um, you know, um, payback, right? Yeah, I would so, be very scared to like hire people on Fiverr right now because I feel like if you hire a writer on Fiverr, they're just going to have ChatGPT exactly write it and give you that. You know, if you are going to hire someone who's a voice actor, unless you're like really, you know, you got to really listen to their samples and yeah. like, I'm hopefully getting you um, because I feel like, yeah, it's, it's very easy to just uh, ask that in, you know, before you could do labor arbitrage, you know, get someone in the Philippines to give you, yeah. you know, fulfill your uh, Fiverr gig and then you just pass it on with a markup. Now you can just do the same thing with ChatGPT or with, uh, with an AI text to speech voice and, you got to be careful about that. Otherwise, you're just going to get a bunch of crap by hiring people through Fiverr. Well, I did, I did feel bad about that because that was kind of where my head went. I think like the first thing to go will be kind of those low effort, like, okay, I'm just going to churn out a bunch of articles or I'm going to do audio transcription. It's like very kind of manual uh, like work that can easily, easily be done by, you know, AI. And I will say I was impressed with the audio transcription that Otter AI did, but it did mess up a lot of, of words. Is a human going to be perfect? No. Uh, so like the AI is doing it so much faster, cheaper. And I, I think like no matter what, there's going to be some sort of like oversight or review process with anything AI generated, at least for like the very uh, near term and, and possibly uh, midterm here. But yeah, it's, it's, 
it's sad and, and fascinating, exciting and scary all at once. I do like the idea of putting out a test that is entirely AI generated, like either a Twitter account that you, you know, plug GPT-4 into or mm. a YouTube account that you, I don't, I know, again, like I have not found the right combination that would be perfect. I feel like you'd really need to, uh, you'd probably need a little bit of human in there still. Um, but, you know, like, gosh, you could do uh, just a GPT generated content, you know, text to speech. You never have a human, so it doesn't sound that odd. And then overlay stock video clips on that. Yeah. And then just churn out those videos in mass. And like, you wouldn't even need that many views per video. Like, you could just like churn, churn, churn. <laughs> so something that I think is is really interesting that I've seen done uh, before that I didn't realize was being done with AI or like supplemented with AI. Um, I would be recommended like videos of movie reviews for like, you know, videos of, or movies I've never seen. And they would like go through the plot points and it would be read. And I was thinking that this was like someone behind the screen. There was no like, um, like video of the person. It was just the voice and they would be talking. And it took me like halfway through the video to realize that this is just a uh, text to speech. And wow, that's impressive. So, what what exactly. model is that? <laughs> right, exactly. I should look look into that. But I, I'm sure they like wrote the the script for it, or maybe they didn't. It's possible that they just said, "Hey, you know, GPT, write up a script for me uh, for this type of video for uh, this movie that came out, and, and give me a review on it." But uh, it's very interesting, and it's like one of those things that I feel like could be very easily automated with GPT and with some sort of like audio synthesizer. Um, and I think those sorts of businesses are going to uh, pop up. You know, you can you can do that fairly easily. Maybe it's almost like uh, like when when the Internet was was kind of in its infancy, there was a lot of affiliate marketers. Right. And I feel like it's a very uh, similar kind of niche where it's like I think we should do it. I think we should start a channel that is entirely AI if we can. So we got to figure out uh, we can get GPT, you know, to write the content. And we have to find, um, you know, either use Eleven Labs and, and one of our voices, or mm -hmm. maybe we tweak that a little bit, see if we can get a better audio recording. Honestly, it's it's probably the best that I've heard. Um, like even the, you yeah. know, when I was playing around with the, the purely AI generated voices, I, I didn't hear anything better than that. Like, they still have the same pauses. Um, so yeah, I think we we could use that. The video is what we got to figure out. Like, what would we do for, you know, there, there's a, what is it? What is the name of that? InVideo, I think, that is, you know, has sort of like a built-in library of stock footage that you can mm -hmm. add, but that's not completely automated. So right. I guess really- I don't know if there's anything for that yet, right? For, for video or B-roll. I don't know. All we need is like a search engine, right? Because we could do something like we could take, um, we could say, you know, uh, we could ask GPT to take its own transcript and like label something about it, you know, for, so for here, for each oh. like 200 word piece, just be like, oh, this, what is this text about? This is about construction. Okay. Just find a construction clip. This section I've is seen about that being done. I I've seen a video of that being done. Um, so we should look into this. We should do it. And even if it's just like an experiment for the podcast and we see. I mean, maybe we have to out. build something, right? Like maybe that's the solution. Like we, uh, we have a little thing to like just piece together um, because all we need, like, so we need a search engine of, um, of videos, like stock footage that we can, they can pull from. Cause then we yeah. can just chunk it up, ask ChatGPT to summarize, give us like a description of something, put that in the search engine, take whatever that first clip is, and then just like, Overlay it, overlay it, overlay it, and just turn it out. I'm so curious what this would what this would make. That would be fascinating. So uh, stay tuned for an episode of of how rich we are from doing a bunch of channels <laughs> about that, <laughs> or just building a business based off of it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like I'm like hyped up now. I'm like, all right, let's get to the API. Let's do this <laughs> <Exactly. program. laughs> Well, I think like that's where like the the opportunity is, right? Of, of just like connecting a bunch of different APIs to build something really cool and and something that. Um, it makes people's lives a lot easier. So, so what do you have? What, what ideas do you have for, uh, for like text to speech in its current state? I feel like something like, I mean, there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of stuff that I think is, is, is kind of shit, but maybe it's less than I think. Um, so like, I feel like a pod, like, or like, a, an audio book read, um, you know, in the AI's version of my voice, it's kind of monotone. I'm not sure I would want to listen to that, but like, maybe some people would you know i that's just my own 
Sometimes I, the internet surprises me. Sometimes there's some pretty terrible articles that rank, uh, and apparently people read them. So like maybe people would listen to stuff that sounds terrible to me. Um, you might get people who listen to the you know, 10, 15 seconds of audio of both of our AI generated voices and be, and say like, oh my God, this is amazing. I need to hear more of this. You, you never know. You might get comments about that. Um, but I think the thing that would be more likely is people would probably want to maybe like license uh, celebrity voices and have them read like a certain audiobook to them. I think that would be interesting. People uh, like having some sort of feeling like they're being connected in some way to this celebrity. Yeah. I think like celebrity worship is, is definitely something that happens a lot in our country. So uh, that seems like an obvious, like easy kind of play to me. So I actually used, um, I have an app called Speechify that okay. I had for a while and I use it to listen to articles because uh, if I'm working, um, you know, let's say, or if I'm, if I'm cleaning, I'm cooking, I'm driving, I, I like to listen to stuff and fill my, my uh, menial time with learning. Yeah. So I, I listen to a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of podcasts, but sometimes I just want articles that are like meteor. Um, and so I can't obviously read them myself. So I'll use Speechify to read that out to me. And also, so for Valentine's Day, I wrote like a, a play to, to act out with my girlfriend. And um, uh, as part of that, there was uh, a narrator for the play. And the narrator, I had Speechify do it in Snoop Dogg's voice. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So I, so I did uh, use the, the celebrity <laughs> Well, there you go. Voice. You're a customer for, for this thing that I'm pitching. So that's yeah. amazing. I, do you, does he, I'm so curious about like the economics of that. Does he get paid like a license? For, he must. For that? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can imagine. I mean, but like, can you, can you license your voice? Like that's something that I guess it's your likeness, right? Yeah, probably. That's probably likeness. how it's classified. I, I mean, I'd imagine there's gotta be something that is, if nothing else, like what are you trying to get on? Right? Like the data is some recording and mm. that recording is itself owned by someone. That's a good point. Um, but so, that's also like uh, that would sort of get into um, what's going on with GPT right now, where it's like they trained all of their models on data that is not like proprietary to them and might be proprietary to some company, right? So that's true. what is like legality behind that? And oh, I definitely think there have a lot of issues there. But I think yeah. with uh, if you label your dog at, or your <laughs> your dog, if you label your voice as Snoop Dogg is there, is there a dog in your in app, <laughs> then. Probably it's safe to say that, you know, that's easier to identify, like, assuming it would be, hey, I mean, you're advertising this voice as my voice. It sounds like me. Clearly, you yeah. trained this on recordings of me. If right. you didn't pay me, then I can sue you. That's a good point. I'm interested, well, like, um, have you seen the comparison? This is not text-to-speech, but it's uh, text-to-image. Have you seen a, a Twitter thread that was um, comparing, I think it's Adobe Firefly with um, Midjourney? No, I haven't seen that. What what was the? What it was pretty it interesting. So it was a series of prompts that was given to both Midjourney and Firefly, and basically Midjourney blew Firefly out of the water. So Adobe is was like, you know, kind of similar to Dolly. Like it, it's just is not that great. Midjourney, right, is fantastic. Yeah, like Midjourney is is amazing, um, and I think a huge part of that is the licensing. So for Firefly, Adobe being an established company, and their customers are all photographers um, or you know people who are artists. They're very careful to do things without infringing on those, right? You can imagine if they just trained on everybody's images, then they could very easily get just like a rebellion of all their like most loyal customers being like, "Ah, you trained it on artists. You're hurting us, right? We're gonna boycott Ooh. your product." So they kind of had to be legal. Plus, they're a larger company. Um, so they only trained on like a bunch of stock images and images owned by Adobe versus Midjourney, which just like presumably trained on everything. <laughs> and, well, yeah, so like Midjourney also doesn't, uh, they clearly don't filter out anything that has intellectual property. So a lot of these prompts were like, um, you know, Pikachu in the alley or something like that. And it just gave you a full on Pikachu. And it's like, well, that's clearly a licensed character. Like you can't right. just generate that and then sell it. Or, you know, so uh, I, yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm, I'm really interested of like what it will come of that. Um, first off, it doesn't surprise me that an Adobe product is inferior to something else that uh, <laughs> seems pretty par for the course. 
But uh, then you look at something like GitHub, which trained its model on all of the code that was on its, you know, its server. So um, without permission, right? And I don't know the depths of, of what they did with that, whether they also did it with private repos or not. I, I want to think they didn't, but who knows? I remember um, hearing that debated, and I also don't remember if there was any conclusion to that. Yeah, I, I, I feel like some of the uh, probably more juicier repos that they would want to train on would be private. Um, that's just me, you know, guessing. But you look at that and, and, and that's like a big company that is potentially doing something that is, um, you know, illegal at worst and, and probably immoral at best. So it's, a, it's an interesting juxtaposition uh, between Adobe and, and GitHub. But yeah, that uh, I really want to play around with Midjourney. I know they they're currently like in a closed. I tried today. I, uh, yeah. I I signed up for them, and uh, they were like, nope, we're uh, we're too we're, we're too good. <laughs> we're too busy. <laughs> exactly. you, you can either try again tomorrow, or or you can pay. Um, but and I gotta imagine like the, the processing power and all the resources they have to use for people to generate these images is is incredible. So yeah, I imagine they they have to you know limit limit people and. I know we talked about sort of the economics of what this is going to look like in the future. I know that was, it was mostly on plugins, but man, it, it's just, I don't know if I don't see a world where it becomes something like me as the end users being charged per use because it's just going to be so expensive. No, I think it will come down. So I think the cost will definitely come down because right now we're sort of in the get bigger and bigger and bigger phase, right? Like, I mean, the main difference between GPT-2 and GPT-4 is just the size. Like you can argue, you know, there are some technical differences, sure, but the biggest difference is just the size. GPT-4 is much, much larger than GPT-2. Um, similarly, you know, like we had the in the in the text to image space, we had the advancement of stable diffusion. That was good. That was an interesting development. And then there's some tweaks on that, and then it's just like more data, bigger models. So I think we will. I mean, that's good, but I think we will roll back a little bit and realize that we, we can actually make these smaller. Um, so several years ago, I was working at Los Alamos, and uh, one of the things that we were studying was sparse neural networks. And so, you know, there was a paper that showed that you basically could take a neural network and delete like 90% plus of the nodes and the connections and retain almost like you'd lose epsilon performance you would retune it a little bit but basically can you, can you know what epsilon performance means i'm assuming it's not a lot but yeah maybe just a small it. number so that's my like my inner mathematician speaking like <laughs> okay. for a mathematician epsilon always also a small stupid number. people please. So, <laughs> so basically it's a small you know it, you you lose a tiny amount of performance basically like you can delete a huge amount of the network um and retain and just lose a small amount of performance but you have to do it strategically so you have to be you have to do it in a very methodical way um, but, and, and these were a different type of neural network, right? We, we were not talking about transformers. Um, we were not talking about, you know, stable diffusion models, but I bet there's something similar. I bet, you know, a lot of these networks are sort of, you know, over parameterized. And so you could probably delete a lot of the parameters and, and like reshuffle things a little bit and you end up with a slight degradation of performance, but then that slight degradation is relative, right? So it's like, if you double the size of the model, and that makes it so much better. And then you delete 90% of it, you're back down to smaller than you were originally and you lose Epsilon from what the larger model was. I, you know, I, I, I can follow that, understand it, but I guess just in, in the way I'm thinking, something like GPT, like a text-based uh, format seems like, yes, that's, that's doable. They're going to be able to scale uh, and, and bring down costs. Uh, something that's like video rendering or image rendering, it just seems like so intensive that it's like there's just some certain cap that's going to have to be put on that. Uh, you can't just have people like rendering billions of hours of video, although I guess maybe YouTube does that today. So uh, I could be wrong. But... YouTube struggled though, right? Like YouTube was a non unprofitable business for quite a long time. Yeah. I imagine that a lot of these businesses are going to be that way as well, but they're, they're they've also uh, taken a different approach though, right? Like Midjourney already, right? They're monetized from the get go. You know, they give you a certain number of credits that you know you may or not may not be able to use depending on the busyness of the server. But other than that, like you got to pay right away. So yeah. I think like it's almost like um, 
yeah, like we've sort of had this narrative of like, oh, people are going to switch away from ads into, you know, subscription models for like several years. And, we, and it hasn't really come to fruition that much. But I think it's like, you know, it is starting to a little bit more like the number of people who are ready to jump on board and pay for chat GPT. And it's like, especially before chat, before GPT-4 was released, because then you were primarily just paying for it not going down during the peak hours. So like you really have to be using it a lot to, to, for it to be that important because I could just wait. I mean, so far, right, on the free version of chat GPT, I never had to wait more than like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, go do something else. Like I'm not, it ha it's not yet so integrated into my workflow that I need it, you know, every like five minutes. Um, so I think for some group of people, they're either, you know, very quick to integrate it a lot, just continuously they need it. Um, and that, that's kind of fascinating that so many people were willing to pay for that right away. Hmm. Do you think that if we end up, uh, you know, say like long term, uh, this, all these services are a lot more mature. Do you think that you'd rather pay like per use or would you rather kind of sell your data in a way as, as the, you know, handshake agreement of, of payment? I... It depends. It depends on the on the use. Um, so I would say, paper use is always a little bit like it makes you f like think in nickel and dime terms. So it's yeah. like, eh, do I really need that image? It'll just be fun. I'm not gonna run it. Versus like you sell a subscription, and then you just use it as much as you want, and then maybe you get more value out of that, right? Um, so it's a little bit stickier, mm. I think, if you have a subscription. Also, subscription revenue is very nice. Uh, yeah. it's, it's consistent. So I think if you have a consumer-facing product that's meant you know, primarily for consumers, which is unclear what exactly that would be, you know, maybe that's something like Replica.ai, right? which was like emotional and erotic conversation with people. Oh, like, wow. That's clearly aimed at interacting with consumers, not businesses. So... In something like that, a subscription definitely makes sense because, like, I don't think you're. I think you can statistically estimate like what the demand is going to be and just price it accordingly. It's sort of like, uh, you know, it's it's similar to the airline model of um, Spirit or the like cruise ship economics, which like a cruise ship sells tickets at a loss and it makes up that because it it knows roughly how much people are going to spend on average and it charges that. You know, like selling you stuff after the fact. Um, but yeah, you can like statistically estimate sort of like what bandwidth of usage is someone going to be? You're like, oh, um, the average usage is, you know, X tokens per month. And then, you know, with 95% certainty, they're not going to use more than Y tokens per month. And we can price it accordingly so that most months we're going to be profitable, something like that. Yeah. And I'm sure other users will subsidize like power users, right? Where they're, they're maybe not getting as much as they're paying for. Um, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, that, that does make sense. But for a business-facing model, I think it'll probably be pay-per-use, um, un unless it's limited in some way. Like, yeah, I mean, pay-per-use in business makes a lot more sense because then you're thinking in terms of like, I, you know, I am a business. I'm using this. I'm getting some type of return on spend. I know that every single time someone uses this, I am profitable in some way because obviously it's going to be whatever you're charging. Not necessarily. I mean, like, as someone who started business, it's like that's certainly not the case. Like sometimes it's still annoying. You still kept yourself nickel and dime thinking, and you're like, eh, do I really need this? Do I not? Because a lot yeah. of times things are far back in the curve of, especially you know, GPT and and image generation are both like content production, and content production tends to live in one of two places. Either it's like organic search traffic, which that'll probably change from you know ChatGPT, but that's one thing. And then the other thing is like ads. So the ad has a direct return on investment, but there's a lot of pieces that go into that, right? It's like, I have to produce the copy. I have to produce the images. I have to decide where to run the ad. I have to pay for that. I have to maybe pay for some tracking software. I have to iterate on that. And like, I don't know what was wrong. Was it the copy that was wrong? Was it the image that was wrong? Was it the video that was wrong? Was it the, you know, the demographics of the audience that I targeted that was wrong? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, there's still, it's not necessarily, I would say this is most applicable to smaller businesses, right? As your business size grows, you have a bigger budget for those experiments. But for like a small business, you still think about those things a lot, you know? And that way you sort of are like a consumer and that you're like, well, I don't know if I want to pay for this because I don't know if I'm going to get a return on investment from it. Um, so I think there'll probably be a category of products that 
cater to small businesses to some degree. And they'll have to think about that, that like, if you really force them to nickel and dime it, they will just not do it. That makes sense. Um, and as you've been talking, I, like this just kind of popped into my head. Uh, does AI generated content scare you? Um, I say that be yeah, I, I really worry about living in a world where like most of content is generated with AI and you lose kind of the, the soul and the artistry of, you know, man-made things. Right. And I wonder, does that become something that is like so rare that it becomes more valued and coveted when it is actually, you know, handmade by a person? I think that's or, already happened. I think you yeah. already have, right. You have companies like you, you can go onto TikTok and find, uh, these little small businesses are like, hey, we're hand crocheting these things or we're hand making these little yeah. products. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't even look like, like it's like a machine could have done that. Like it's not even that special. Yeah. You know, it's not even what you're talking about where it's like it, it, it retains some extra character. Sometimes it does. But some of these things I've seen are just literally like I, I like me personally, I'm a very uh, utilitarian type of person if I buy something. Like if, if a person can produce this little wood sculpture and a machine can produce the same wood sculpture oh, for yeah. half the price, I'm gonna buy it from the machine. But maybe but, that's not the analogy though. Like I, some I, people, think it... I think want the fact that it is the scarcity, right? It's just the fact it's like, uh, you know, this thing is a little bit more scarce. So I'm, I'm acting like a collector. I'm gonna buy it from these, or, or it's a, sort of like a moral point of view. Like I wanna support this person who's creating things, but I think that is already exists, like it, even just as a pushback to like industrialization. Yeah, I do agree with that in terms of like a lot of people would rather this like handmade thing versus this thing that was built in a factory. But I guess the analogy that I might liken it to is, you know, some apple pie that you get from uh, some chain bakery versus your mom's like famous apple pie, right? That there's, there are very different levels to it. Yeah. Um, one's made with love, one's made with care and the others just mass produced to get as much money as possible. And I wonder, uh, I, I guess, you know, I've kind of answered and you've also answered my question that that is going to happen. People are going to covet, you know, man-made things a lot more. And uh, I wonder kind of what extent it will go, you know? It's also funny because you use the word artistry, like, you know, is, is the human creation going to be viewed as more artistic? And, you know, I remember years ago, like when I was an undergrad, I liked playing with um, mathematically, algorithmically generated music. And yeah. to me, that was kind, like, <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was artistry. Like I found it really fun to like create, if I could create music without doing anything myself, like to me, that was cooler than like anything I could create. I was like, this yeah. is so interesting. Like I just created this algorithm that is generating music all by itself. Mm. I didn't have any input into it. Like to me at that point, right? I was like, this is, way better than anything I could produce. And it wasn't but, even like it was high quality music. Like it was kind of shitty. You know, I but can I ask a question on that yeah. a follow up? Were you like typing in, hey, I want to create this type of music and then it was just done for you? Or did you actually have to, you know, do some things to make it sound I did have to way? do some things. That's that's I think the crux of it is it's that kind of tactile feedback of like, hey, I'm actually like tuning the knobs or like, you know, changing these levels and, and making music versus I just want music to sound like this, typing it in and having it done. There's a little, uh, not handholding, but just like it's being given to you rather than you earning it a little bit. And I yeah. feel like maybe that would change your opinion. If you did the same exact thing with some sort of model that could create music, would you find it as interesting and cool and valuable? That is something I feel like is, is something to think about. No, for sure. I think that's a, that's a good point because if I had just uh, you know put in a prompt and then it came out, it wouldn't be quite as cool. I mean, I do find it interesting when ChatGPT gives me poems or raps or something like that. So I guess to a degree, I still find it fun, but it definitely, you know, I have a little bit more uh, enjoyment or pride in it if, I'm, if it's something I've like tinkered with and then right. I'm like, ah, yes, it comes out with something that sounds not quite so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, on that same path, I was, I was talking to a coworker today and um, we were kind of Man, it's funny, like how AI has really become like the dominant, um, you know, thing to talk about in in work culture and especially software engineering. But uh, we we were talking about, you know, will people in the future just be like give, providing these prompts, getting answers, and and really not understanding the context of these things, and and maybe like not being as problem solving oriented, like being able to do something like that as easy. 
I, I really wonder what that is going to end up looking like and, and doing to us, you know, like 20 years down the line when, when GPT and, and other technologies are so ingrained with our, our culture and our everyday use. That like, I, do, I do think it will shift. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So a really interesting uh, sort of dichotomy for me was in grad school, I was in a math PhD program and uh, one of my best friends from grad school, uh, he was in the CS PhD program. And we talked about various types of like business ideas and just technologies to invent or work on. And we thought about things definitely like I thought about things more declaratively and he thought about things more imperatively. So I was thinking about, you know, to me, and I think this also is like just the viewpoint of a mathematician. Like a lot of the, the problem is like, can you state the problem correctly? Because one of the biggest annoyances, especially to an applied mathematician, is that you work with some other field, be it, you know, physics, mathematics, engineers, um, and like, they just, they won't state the problem correctly. Like they, you know, you, you leave out stuff. It's the same thing actually that it's exactly the same dynamic as if you run a software development agency and your client tells you what they want, but they don't tell you enough information. You're like, you're telling me um, something very vague. Make it and better. Like, there's actually yeah. a lot more that you need to go into this because what you're telling me is ill-defined. Like it's not well-defined, like what you're actually asking me. It's, it's unclear but to the person asking they don't realize that it's unclear um so my you know w when you're in, in math uh you got to make sure that you're taking the applied problem and like representing it mathematically in the correct way because you might if you make the wrong problem you might spend a long time trying to solve it maybe you do solve it and then you take it back and you're like that's the wrong problem they don't actually you know maybe you were working with a group of chemists and they're like we don't actually care about that you know that's that's not the problem we needed solved so to me, I think I've probably always been a more declaratively focused person. Um, my first emphasis is generally to state the problems correctly and like know what the goal is, and then secondarily to try to solve it. Hmm. Versus, you know, my my friend in grad school was opposite. Like he was like, I want to take a given problem that's specified already, and I'm going to be the best at solving it. And I think, you know, having a world of, of AI probably pushes us more towards the declarative side because it can do a lot of that problem solving, but it's still just as important to be able to phrase the problem correctly. If you can't specify what that problem actually is, you'll just solve the wrong thing. Yeah, but I also do feel like that uh, skill of like problem solving yourself doesn't apply to just... Uh, you know, searching something on the web or, um, you know, looking up a recipe or something like that. Like that is an everyday life skill that, you know, long after you're, you've unplugged from the internet, you need to have. And, and when AI and, um, you know, these, these sorts of tools start taking that away from you and you're not as practiced, I do think that that is something that like diminishes you as, as maybe a person a little bit. And so I, I worry a little bit about that uh, and the extent to which, It'll take us. So, I, I we're already like. So, do you far... worry about not knowing assembly? I don't. So, I would say, are you that this is the same thing? I actually think I do worry about it. Like, I spent when I was learning, um, you know, about computers initially. Uh, I was very annoyed that I didn't know assembly because I wanted. Mm -hmm. I like understanding things top to bottom. Yeah. And so same. I spent a while, like I actually like like studied circuits and and assembly, and like I learned enough that like. I, I can't claim to like know the full stack, but like I at least convinced myself that I kind of understood what was going on at the different levels. Like, okay, we have these different registers, like assembly, we have these like, you know, shift around registers, move this bit of information from this register to this register, perform this basic operation. And then I was like, okay, I could convince myself that these operations could piece together into any of these higher level operations. Any higher level operation I could decompose into these smaller things. I don't have to do that for every single time, but I just could see how it could work. And then, you know, even below assembly, I'm like, all right, you shift to register. How does that work? Like these transistors are going over here, but that was just me. Like I just wanted to know top to bottom in practice. I don't know how much that actually helped me. And also I didn't need to know that. I just kind of dived down and did it for fun, but it doesn't really have any practical impact. Like I never use Ooh. assembly, have never used assembly. I've never, you know, I never use any of the really low level languages anymore. I, I did some C stuff way back and now I have not, I mean, C is still useful, but like for most things, especially the things I work on, 
not really that useful. That's, I think that's a fair point. Uh, I think there are a lot of technologies I use that I don't know top to bottom and I just know how to use them. Right. And, and I think that's I, like I, sort of like the, uh, like the difference almost between declarative and imperative is I feel like one of just granularity, like what is the difference between an objective and a task? Like an objective is something that you want done and a task is maybe an activity, like something that you're going to do. So you, what you want done versus what you're going to do. But if you decompose an objective into smaller and smaller and smaller objectives, at some point, it becomes kind of difficult and maybe meaningless to try to differentiate between what is a task and what is an objective. Hmm. And so I think, you know, even like going to the level of like, you know, I'm going to move my arm. Like, is this a task or is this an objective? Like, I want my hand here. Okay. Can I like decompose that into anything smaller? I mean, there's a bunch of impulses that go into that right I, I initially when i was a baby learned how to move my hand this way and control my fingers but now i don't think about it it doesn't matter to me all i care about is this larger level objective which is like i can go from here to here i can accomplish that and so if i abstract away these like lower level things i do think there's something that's lost right like somebody still has to understand assembly yeah somebody still has to understand circuits but i don't think as many people need to understand it right humans have limited time and limited capacity and like if we all have to understand assembly every time, then we sort of don't get to benefit from abstraction. And I think technology abstraction is exactly what allows technology to be useful. It allows us to like not worry about something, push it down into point. the stack, and then we can do other stuff. Yeah, and so as these technologies evolve and do things for us or hand us things, maybe the problems that we're solving are, are changing and shifting. Um, so it might not be fair to say that it's, you know, it's just that problem solving uh, muscle is being completely eroded. I think it's just moving um, up, the, up the stack. Like you're just, just going to solve a more abstract puzzle. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, okay, so do you have any final thoughts of, of audio synthesizing and, and what we've done with, with AI today? Uh, so I, I want to hear if you have any um, any additional interesting business ideas that I'm trying to steal all my business with, ideas. With, uh, <laughs> you know, well, it, it'll kind of be like a, you know, it's, it's like a win-win, right? Because right now, for a new podcast, barely anyone listens to us. Oh, no, so like the joking. chance that someone listens to us, like if, joking, if enough okay. people listen to us, that they do steal the idea, that's a win. <clears throat> that, that's great. And yeah. then if they, they don't, become... then we still have the idea. So it's a win-win either way. I hope they become rich beyond their wildest dreams. And I hope they just remember us and give us a few percent. I mean, that's all we can ask for. Yeah, and, um, and, and hit the like button also. Exactly. So what was the question? What, uh, other so what, what, uh, what are some business ideas, especially given the current state of AI, right? So we have like, uh, you know, you could, you could experiment with the, uh, the fully automated YouTube channel. Um, I think <laughs> yeah. that's a question. That's an open question for me, whether or not, I guess you said you found a video that you, uh, were enraptured with. So that yeah. sounds promising. So maybe it is good enough to listen to. Um, an audiobook is another one that to me feels like not there i mean i don't think i would want to listen to the monotone voice for that long like i already on audible you know sometimes i get an, a narrator that just is really monotone i'm like i can't listen to this i, I have mm -hmm. to go to something else um so to me i'm not sure if like audiobook trans or like uh you know recording audiobooks is is necessarily an application yet i think it'll get there very quickly um certainly within the next five years i think we'll have very good quality uh text to speech even to the point of like singing like i think we could have like a a fully like you could have a, like a, a complete end to end like e-girl pop star of like all the songs are written by ai they're sung by ai it's an ai generated video of a per, you know of a fake person and like that being is just like owned by some company that like owns that entire intellectual property stack so i think that's probably coming within five years and like that will also apply to audiobooks, and you, you have an audiobook that's like has multiple characters. Every fiction audiobook could have each character voiced by a different um, AI uh, speech or an AI voice. But I don't think that's yet. I think so far you're still kind of limited because it still kind of sucks. So there's a limited number of things that yeah, I think you could do that well with it. Um, one of them is probably like phone sex. Phone sex. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess that does. That's a off the wall but i probably a good idea yeah like there, i mean like the uh you know that that industry the adult industry is certainly one that like uh, they're always a they're always a first things. adapter in, in... 100%. I, I think <laughs> other than that yeah. i'm not sure what like you know where are you willing to take that little bit of sacrifice of like voice quality so 
Yeah, I, I think uh, if we look at kind of the landscape of how audio is used today, it's mostly for entertainment, right? And so a lot of what you mentioned, I think, is is great. One that was kind of came to my head as you were talking is um, you know people with disabilities. I wonder if yeah uh, there could be something good in that space. Whether it's like if I'm hard of hearing, uh, maybe there's a certain uh, like tone or or voice that that helps me hear a little bit better. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know the extent of, um, you know, people who are hard of hearing what they have to deal with, but maybe there's a certain audio frequency that helps. Uh, also, um, you know, other, other disabilities, maybe there's something that would soothe me or, uh, help like calm anxiety, like just things are around that I think is potentially interesting. And I'd, I'd have to do a lot of experimentation around what sort of businesses you can do, but yeah, maybe um, a, maybe a meditation app that uh, you yeah. make the pauses even longer, <laughs> <laughs> even more monotone and <laughs> and just a very quiet monotone voice. Yeah, um, ASMR too. Test I mean, your head on the pillow, Matt. I I Test do know that, <laughs> <laughs> and then I would I would immediately fall asleep and I would feel great. I think that's a good business idea. Somebody should take that. But um, I know I was joking before about ASMR, but I know that is a very uh, um, not common, but I guess uh, a field that people like. Uh, I I'm not really a big fan, but there's also uh, mukbangs. Uh, I, I wonder, do you know, you've never heard of no. this. No. So I don't I don't know the exact definition, but uh, from what I've seen, a mukbang is like where somebody will eat a lot of food and they're just like making like the chewing noises and. Oh, um, that sounds horrible. Yeah. So for a lot of people, I guess that that's soothing. I, Though, to be fair, I think what might be appealing to people for that is is that they feel like somebody's like eating with them. So it's like a more of a comfort slash like not feeling lonely thing. Um, mm, and so there might be, have to be like a video component to that. I don't That's know. That's what I was, if, I was wondering if, too. If, if Even for ASMR, audio. I feel like there might be, you know, I feel like a lot of ASMR there mm -hmm. still comes with a video, but maybe not. Maybe it, it does come with it, but I guess just. Like, uh, I don't know if people would listen. Do people listen to just ASMR? audio no like if if you're listening if you're watching this and you do listen yeah, to asmr know, please. please let us know is there like a podcast that's just asmr sounds that you listen to without watching it that'd be interesting that would be interesting i would just bug me i would just all i'd be like why is this crinkling in my hair it doesn't that doesn't bother me but it's also not something that's like oh I, I need to like hear more of this and the food eating would probably annoy me more than that would definitely annoy the, me more yeah i'm easily distracted so little sounds constantly like yeah, <laughs> no just get out, get out. <laughs> like nails across the chalkboard. Yeah, but all right. I mean, do you have anything else or? Um, no, I mean, it's surprisingly, you know, I was thinking about this and I, it's kind of annoying because I feel like, uh, you know, it's sort of come so far yet still sucks. And so then there's like limited things that I can think of that are actually that interesting to do with it. Well, uh, from our first podcast, we, we had an experiment we wanted to do and we've done it. I think we've got another experiment we want to try out this time. So maybe in our next podcast or in a couple episodes, we'll have some sort of episode on, you know, just creating a, a quote unquote YouTube uh, channel that's entirely AI or as much AI as we can make it. I yeah, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hook up its payments to the blockchain and it'll, it'll just be like a fully <laughs> oh, autonomous God. AI We're system. <laughs> We're going to the moon. I love to hear it. All right. Awesome.